Um, thanks for bringing with me. Uh, as uh, Rebecca shared, I'm Emily Robinson, and I'm here to give a talk on USAR's introduction to machine learning in AWS. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit about what this talk will cover. The first thing is the why and the what of the cloud in general, and also specifically Amazon Web Services, aka AWS. Then, of course, this is a talk about using R with AWS. So we have, how do we connect to AWS from R? Uh, you can use R, as I'll talk about a little bit, within uh, AWS offers sort of notebooks, like in your browser, you can use one of their, their environment to code. But I will talk about it, how to connect from your local um, you know, instance of R, R Studio on your computer. Uh, one of those reasons being uh, potentially to save money, because if you're running notebooks in AWS, it will cost you money during that. I'll also introduce some helpful AWS terms and packages. And using those packages uh, to, in this case, because I'm talking about how to do image classification with AWS, how to upload images to Amazon storage system, which is called S3, how to train an image classification model, and then finally, how to evaluate that model's performance. I'll end this talk with how to learn more. Uh, you know, we only have a little under an hour here today to cover everything. My talk will probably be about half an hour. There's much more uh, to learn about AWS, about SageMaker, et cetera. So I'll, I'll leave you with some of the resources to do so. And given this little limited time, there are some things this talk won't cover. And that includes uh, doing machine learning using any other cloud technology. And again, this is really in the instance of, um, uh, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, and because some of the principles you'll learn here, while the specific techniques or the specific you know, commands or packages might not apply to other machine learning platforms, some of the ideas behind it will. I also won't talk about the math and the theory behind the model or any other algorithms uh, besides one image classification algorithm. And this is because this is much better covered in other resources, um, you know, even general machine learning resources. And really what I wanted to demonstrate here was how to make a model using AWS SageMaker, how to train it using images and uploading and connecting to AWS, and not, I will note, how to make a good model. And you'll see why in a little bit. A little more about my background in AWS and my learning journey. So when I started out, I definitely was wondering, what, what is the cloud? And I like my, uh, my co-author of, of the book uh, that Rebecca mentioned, Build a Crew in Data Science, Jacqueline Nolis, her definition is that cloud services is really just expensive sky laptops. As in, they are actually computers sitting somewhere in a server farm in Virginia or wherever else. Um, you know, and, and they may not have a, a monitor connected to it, right? So not necessarily the, the interface that you may be used to, but they're really basically the same thing as that powers your laptop or desktop computer. And so AWS is a suite of cloud services and it includes a lot of different products. So we'll really be focusing on just one today, which is the SageMaker product. And SageMaker is their product for machine learning. And it covers everything from getting your data, whether it's, it's pre-processing or for example, their ground truth where you can get your data labeled. Say if you have images and you need someone to label, is this a cat or a dog? From building the model, training and tuning it, all the way to deploying it and managing the model while it's in production. Now, a lot of these things, these are things that you can do on your laptop, right? So, or when I say on your laptop, right, all of this is through your laptop, but I mean locally, right? Not connected to any service, not, not paying for someone else's machine. So why the cloud? Well, there's one uh, reason why, which is that you can talk about in your interview, right? So here we have Brendan Rahura saying, oh, when you have a problem, you can build two solutions, a deep Bayesian transformer running a multi-cloud Kubernetes and a SQL query built on top of a stack of egregiously oversimplifying assumptions. And you can put that on your resume and the other one in production. Uh, and then everyone goes home happy. But in all seriousness, um, this is not, you know, for your resume, yes, companies are interested, uh, you know, more companies are interested in people who have experience in the cloud. But that's not really why, you know, I use it, I recommend you to. And the real reason is that you can get access to a supercomputer. 
uh, which means there are certain types of model that are quite difficult to train with the resources that you most likely have in your laptop. So for example, um, a many layered uh, neural network on millions of images. The other reason is that you can start with the cloud services uh, model blueprint, which is the case when I, with the model, I'll discuss about the image classification. And finally, as we saw on the description of AWS SageMaker, it offers a full pipeline. You can store your data, train your model, create an endpoint for real-time inference and monitor performance, sort of all in one product and offers tools to make it easier to do so. All right, well, given that, that's why the cloud, but why AWS in, uh, specifically? And the uh, the answer, one of the answers is it's what my old company, Warby Parker, uses. Um, but, you know, and, and that is the, sort of the real reason for why I started using AWS. Um, so seriously, if your company already uses the cloud technology, I would recommend using that. If your company already has, um, you know, security set up and, uh, the, the billing setup, et cetera, and, and approvals for, uh, say, whether it's Google Cloud or Azure from Microsoft, I would use that. And in my case, it was Amazon. But otherwise, if you're just doing this independently, you can check out um, any of these other ones, you know, including you know, Azure, Google Cloud, IBM, Saturn Cloud. There are a lot of options out there. And a lot of them also have a free tier or free credits. I say this because I want to address one of the common issues that may stop people from getting started with using the cloud, which is how the heck does the pricing work? And am I going to end up with a $10,000 bill or more, either for myself or my company? And so a little bit of pricing one-on-one -on -one for AWS, which is that you are billed by the hour and it's determined by the machine you choose to use. The uh, pricing is pretty transparent. So for example, for SageMaker, you can see at this link, the prices for everything, and it goes everywhere from $0.05 cent an hour up to $28 an hour. And this was helpful for me because I initially thought, well, can I like, you know, accidentally use a computer too much and it will, it will end up costing me more? And the answer is no, um, you, you cannot, right? It's just a flat rate per hour, whether you're sort of actively using or you're idling it. And some things can be shut off um, or are shut off automatically when they're done. And you can also shut them off when you're not using it. So for example, I mentioned earlier, you can, well, I'll be showing how you can run, connect to SageMaker from like the R instance uh, on your local machine. You can run R in a notebook hosted by SageMaker. That will cost money per hour, but you can stop it at any time. Um, it will take a minute a few minutes to restart and you will lose everything in memory, but you will not lose anything you have saved. So you can save files in that notebook instance and those will uh, still be there when you restart your instance. The other thing that keeps you from necessarily spending too much money is that you can you have to submit, uh, at least for a personal account, you have to submit a support ticket to use some of the more expensive machines. So by default, they do not allow you to use those $28 an hour machines. Um, this is sort of to protect you from yourself. And finally, you can see um, your bill at the any time at the AWS billing console, and you can also set budgets alerts for yourself. So you can be told, you can say, hey, if I get over $10 a month or whatever you wanna set your limit to, please alert me and please email me. Now look, this doesn't mean you there, there's absolutely no way that you could rack up a large bill. Like it, it has happened. You may have seen horror stories, but it, it is harder than you might believe. Um, and so if you approach it a little carefully, and most of the times you may not need, you probably don't need that $28 an hour instance, um, or you choose options like training jobs, which automatically shut off after they're done, um, you can avoid um, getting a really large unexpected bill. So here's how I got it started with AWS, basically diving in the deep end because there were a lot of things I didn't know before the project I did at Warby um, on image classification. And that included really anything about image classification um, or the cloud or deep learning. Um, you can see image classification model I use is a deep learning model or AWS SageMaker SDK or what SageMaker was, what an SDK was, and that question of whether I'd accidentally rack up a $30,000 bill and get fired. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk, because I wanted to demystify a little bit um, 
what it means to work in AWS um, and make it hopefully a little bit less intimidating and easier for you all to get started if you'd like to. And so with that, I'm going to walk through an image classification problem example. And you know, I want to emphasize it's really truly one of the hardest ML problems of our time. And that is, is a dog an 11 or 12 out of 10 or 13 or 14? Now, if you're not familiar with ratings of dogs based on their images, this is from the Twitter account, we rate dogs, AKA at dog underscore rates. And this started out um, from a guy who's rating dogs and giving them all ratings out of 11 or 12 or more out of 10. And the, the man behind this account <laughs> now shared that he is able to drop out of school because he has effectively monetized this Twitter account where he numerically rates uh, objectifies dogs. So the data set I'm using for the example today was um, gotten using our tweet, download file and some regex to get the images and ratings from uh, a little over 350 uh, tweets from dog rates. And of those images, 235 were 11 or 12 out of 10, 120, and 121 were 13, 14, or the very rare 15 out of 10. I rescaled these images to be the same size with magic, and then I randomly divided it into a training validation and holdout set. Uh, I'd like to um, share here that all of the code available that I'll talk about is, is a that I'll talk about today is available on my GitHub. You can find that at github.com slash Robinson ES slash we rate dogs. A little bit of a spoiler alert for the end of this talk. How did this model end up doing? Well, if you are familiar with deep learning um, or image classification, you may have guessed that it is perhaps the worst image classification model that's ever run, but it did run. And that is really what I was looking for for this talk was again, as I said at the beginning, it's not about making a good model. It's showing you how to uh, train a model using AWS SageMaker, and in this case, an image classification model. First, we have to do a little setup. And I want to give a disclaimer that there will be a lot of code in this talk. And the target audience for this talk are people that are new to AWS, um, or at least new to SageMaker. And so most likely this code will be totally new for you. And I want to say, don't try to memorize it. All of the code is, again, in this GitHub repo. And these slides are publicly available online. And this talk is being recorded. So I am showing you this code. But overall, I want you to kind of focus on the big picture of the steps that you need to do. And that first step is, perhaps not surprisingly, to create an AWS account. Um, and so I've linked here to the um, AWS help page where it talks about how to create and activate an account. And the next step is you need to make your keys. The idea behind your keys or your security credentials is this is how you essentially authenticate from you know, your local RStudio instance to AWS that, hey, this person is, you know, in my case, Emily Robinson and this laptop that make these commands, they have permission to kind of interface and, and bill uh, through AWS. So you need to, to download these keys on your local laptop and then you'll be able to authenticate to AWS. So you save your credentials to your R environment. I'm a big fan of the use this um, edit, of the use this package in general. And it has a function for editing your uh, environment in R. And there you can set, obviously these are our are, are, uh, dummy keys, but you can set your, your key ID, your secret access key and your region. And so again, this will allow you to connect from your local R studio to your AWS account. Now your next step you'll wanna do is you'll wanna install and import some Python packages. And I'm gonna do that through Reticulate, which is an R package for uh, interfacing with Python and being able to run Python functions and pass data pa back and forth. And specifically, I'm going to um, install the uh, SageMaker Python SDK, uh, which is stands for Software Developer Kit and Pandas, and import the Bato3 package, which is one of the, the AWS packages within the SDK. Now, you may be saying, hey, I came here for a use our talk. What the heck is this Python doing in my code? And what I would say is that Python really is a better language for using AWS. And the reason for that is that there is no officially um, R, official R package that is supported by AWS. 
Now, PAWS is a pretty good general package for accessing AWS. Again, it's not an official package that's supported by AWS, although it is cited in some of their materials, but it does not have any SageMaker function. So it doesn't have the functions we'll need um, to do our SageMaker tasks. And that's why we'll use Reticulate to use Python functions in our studio. And indeed, this is also what AWS and their official docs recommends. Uh, if you look at their documents for using R, you'll find that they use Reticulate to call Python functions. Once you, if you're not familiar with Reticulate, once you import, so I'll just go back briefly. Once you import that Bado3 package as the variable Bado3, you can then call functions within the Bado3 package using the dollar sign. So in this case, I'll call the function uh, uh, client. I'll make an S3 client. So this is saying, hey, I want to do things with S3, which is Amazon storage system. And then from S3, again, that dollar sign accessing within it to create a bucket. And buckets are essentially folders um, within AWS. So you can think of them as like kind of like the high level folders. So in my case, I'm doing a project, I'm gonna call the bucket We Rate Dogs. Maybe you're doing multiple projects, um, you know, with, with, with totally different data. And so then you'd make a separate bucket for that. So I create this bucket and then I wanna upload my images that I've downloaded um, uh, from Twitter to this bucket. So in this case, I walk through all of my images, both the holdout, the train, and the validation set um, using the per walk function. And then I upload each of those to the we rate dogs bucket um, with the file name that they have. And I'm just removing this resized images. So now you can optionally, if you're, if you're not sure if it worked, you can go to your web browser. You can go into AWS, you can go into S3 and you can see the objects that you've uploaded. So in my case, I can see Andy, Batman, and Bo, these are all names for the dogs. I can see they've been successfully uploaded to S3. Now our next step is we have to create a, um, a table of image info. And so what I mean is we have all these images, but we need to know, okay, what, you know, we're training a machine learning model and we're gonna do uh, I dichotomize the rating. So it's either zero if it's an 11 or 12 or one if it's 13, 14, 15. And I have to say, hey, for each image, what's its rating? Is it a zero or is it a one? Because um, otherwise it won't be able to train the model. So in this case, um, I've made a, um, a list uh, or a table or tibble for the training, for the validation. And I'm gonna um, you know, write that to a table um, because this is the, the format it needs to be in for AWS as a .lst file um, separated by tabs uh, with no column names and no row names, right? I'm just going to upload this information. So um, AWS has a mapping of each image location to its rating. You can see here, this is how I upload it, the same upload file to the we Wait Dogs bucket. I upload those .lst files. All right, so we have the raw information we need to train our deep learning model, which are the images themselves and uh, you know, their classification, like whether they're one or a zero. So now we can get into training the model. One thing that really confused me when I got started with SageMaker was that it has a high level and a low level API. What that means is that there are really two ways to do things in SageMaker and the doc documents, like official documentation might show either way. And the low level is when you really need to like nitpick and you want to change certain things. And the high level is meant to make it a little bit easier, a little bit less code when you, you know, want to do more generic things. You don't necessarily need as fine tuned controls. In general, this is something you'll find with AWS where there's a lot of ways to do something. Here's a tweet from uh, Corey Quinn who tweets a lot about, I think it's an AWS consultant full uh, or consultant for people around AWS, he doesn't work for AWS full time, and you know he talks about how um, there are you know 17 ways to deploy containers on AWS. So to do this one task, there are 17 different services that do that. So in general, this might be something you'll find when you start with AWS. Uh, which again is one reason why I wanted to give this talk and be like, well, here's here's one way that will get you from A to Z. Um, but just know that there are all these other ways out there, and it's it's not you, it's AWS. 
to work in SageMaker, we need to make an IAM role. And basically this is around, um, you know, it's very useful for corporations, right? Because they might not want everyone who has an AWS account to be able to do certain things, uh, whether it's because they don't want them to see certain files that are privileged or whether they don't want them to be able to run machines that cost $28 an hour. Even if you're just using it, um, you know, yourself and you're not, you're not necessarily like, oh, you don't need many roles, right? It's just you and the AWS account. You, you still need to make an IAM role for yourself that has access to SageMaker. You can create this role um, through the URL following these steps. Uh, again, I've linked to where you can find these. And once you've done that, you can get the, um, the basically the, in your local R instance, you can get what that ARN, basically the identifier for that role is. So here I'm getting, I made a role through the URL on my web browser for SageMaker called SageMaker underscore role. And I'm getting that ARN. Again, so this will give all the code I'm running. I had already set up access to interface with AWS in general, but now it knows, hey, this person can not only like get into AWS um, and maybe do some stuff with S3, they can do things with SageMaker. So our next step is to create an estimator. And an estimator is basically essentially the specification for a model. And in this case, Amazon comes with certain uh, you know, Docker images that are basically model blueprints. And so that's what I'm gonna work off of. So we can see here, they have a model blueprint for an image classification model. So in my case, I was like, great, let me start with them. Let, let me start with that. Let me start with the neural network. And I have to specify certain things. I have to say, for example, okay, what type of machine do I want to run, right? So I talked at the beginning how you can choose, these are called instances. Mine is called the very helpful name MLP2XLarge. As you can sort of guess, there are things around this name that tell you how big the image is and that pricing uh, that I linked to earlier, it will tell you, uh, you know, how many, how many cores it has, how much memory, et cetera. Um, generally, I re they're often recommended um, instances they have to use with their models. I would probably start with that. And if you run into trouble, say you run out of memory, um, you can always move to, you can always retrain your model on a larger instance. And some of this code is just sort of uh, boilerplate code. But again, this was boilerplate code that took a little while for me to learn, which is, hey, how do I tell it like what the input is, their files? How do I tell it where to put the output in this like S3 folder, in this S3 bucket, et cetera? You know, as we, uh, if you're used to training models, you know, you have to set hyperparameters. So um, each uh, model blueprint that AWS has, there are, um, pages that they have that document what are the hyperparameters um, that you can set and what are the uh, options available for that hyperparameters, right? In some cases, uh, it's not, you know, infinite. It's like, okay, you can set this to be two, four, or six, for example, or the mini batch size, you know, I think has to be multiple of 16. Um, so I, in this case, you know, I'm just setting these hyperparameters, telling it, you know, how many training samples do I have? How many epochs? All these things about doing neural networks. Then I have to tell it, where do I get the data from? So to train this data, I have to say, hey, where's the input data for the training? Where's the, the validation data? Data. Where are those tables that I made that say, hey, these are the, you know, what image, each image, what is it? What value does it have? Is it a zero or the one? And I have to make essentially a dictionary of it. And so again, I sort of am sharing this code, you know, this, this exact code will be on my GitHub and you can find it, but this is the, this is the code you need to write to say, hey, I'm looking for, um, you know, these type of, these type of images in this place. And then finally, we can get to fitting our model. So we can go back that I see, if we go back, we can see that was the estimator. We kind of added onto it with the uh, hyperparameters. Now we're going to add as an input to it and the arguments, the data channels that we specified, hey, where the heck is this data? And we're going to put as, yeah, we might as well get some logs out. This is another step where you can go and you can view in your browser how the training job is doing. So we can see in this case, it took eight minutes to complete the run. Now, I will say this is maybe an optimistic view because more likely if you're like me, you find a bunch of failed runs uh, before that because you misspecified something. Now. Fortunately, if you click on any of these, you can view their logs and often it will tell you, hey, here's the thing that went wrong. Here's the error message you got. 
Um, and one of these things, even if your job succeeds, one of the nice things you can do is you can view your logs. Okay, how did it go along the way, right? How was the accuracy during this epoch? So if you're not familiar with neural networks, epochs essentially like running through, you know, the data set one time. So, okay, the, the, the second run through the epoch two, it was the train accuracy, it was 0.50. Um, and then on the next one, it was higher, it was 0.61. And the next one, oh, it was sort of like staying the same. It didn't get much higher, um, you know, et cetera. So you can see how the accuracy is doing on your train, your validation set. Now, your final step, and this sort of surprised me when I started with stage makers, actually, once you train the model, you don't get any predictions back. Like you get a model that is trained, right? But you have to uh, run that model um, with, uh, if you're, if you're running a lot of them at once, you do this through AWS batch transform and you have to, you know, run that on your, uh, in this case, I'm running it on my validation images. So this is now going to take that model that's in the IC variable and we're going to run it, um, on the validation images. And then again, you think this would maybe be easier, but then you have to do all this code to get back. Okay, great. I ran this okay, well, tell me what are the labels, right? For each of those images, like, is it a zero or the one that the model came out? So again, we're going to go back to that spoiler alert, which is how did that image classification model do? And the answer is very not surprisingly for everyone, it predicted that uh, the rating was, in this case, they called it low, was a zero basically, right? So because there, it was more common for the rating to be an 11 or 12, aka a low rating than a higher rating, my model, which was only trained on like, uh, you know, less than 300 images, just uh, got the best accuracy by saying that everything is rated low. Uh, so again, if you actually want to apply this, I would recommend having many more images than this. And also you could probably, uh, once you have a better baseline set of data, you can also continue to improve things through hyperparameter tuning or, you know, or other methods that again are, sort you know, you can find in, in many like machine learning textbooks. All right, to close out this talk, as I said at the beginning, I wanna share some resources, uh, which is there is, you know, AWS certainly does not suffer from a lack of documentation. As I said, it's really more that there is sometimes like too much documentation, too many features. Um, so here's a little bit of a curated list, uh, which is that the, the Python SageMaker, that SDK, you know, the things that I was calling for reticulate the functions, uh, and their arguments, those are all documented on sagemaker.readthedocs.io. AWS also has some example notebooks, um, which is kind of, you know, somewhat similar to what I showed here, which is basically taking you through, you know, all the steps needed for running different types of models. So, for example, an XJBoost model. Um, there's also a developer guide. There are, uh, you know, outside resources like Udacity uh, for uh, Ron SageMaker. And then finally, if you're interested uh, in general in deep learning, um, Deep Learning with Python by Francois Cholet is a very highly recommended book um, that I actually have on my bookshelf here uh, around deep learning um, if, you're not, if you're not too familiar with it. My top takeaways uh, that I'd like you to go away this from this talk with, and that, that really were my biggest takeaways, um, I'd say like the first six months of using AWS, is that it's actually pretty hard. It's, again, it's certainly not impossible, but it's, it's fairly difficult to rack up a huge bill. And I would not let, you, let that dissuade you from getting started. If you can use Python, it's uh, like, and what I mean by that is kind of straight Python rather than calling it through reticulate. It's probably easier, especially if you use the SageMaker Jupyter Notebook. So that notebooks that SageMaker offers, again, they cost, you know, five cents, 10 cents, 20 cents an hour. But especially if you're using those, I do think if you're comfortable in Python, it is easier to do it with that. Uh, one thing I will give a plug in is something I have not done a lot of, but I'm interested in is Quarto, which is uh, a new um open source uh, package or tool from our studio, which is basically the newest generation of R Markdown and allows you to really easily switch between R and Python um, within the same document. And so in that case, what, I'm, what I mean is not calling, using reticulates called Python function, but having in say chunks, like just pure Python chunks. And so I am interested in trying that out because I will say it's, it just sometimes like is a little bit smoother if you're not having to call it through reticulate each time. 
Well, as I said, there's a lot of resources for and ways to do things in AWS. Like you can find a lot of things that will get you started. And with that, there is a lot to learn. And I, but I really think that you can get value just by doing one piece, just by one step at a time, right? So maybe that step is you don't even worry about machine learning, but you're like, how the heck can I get something in S3, an Amazon storage system, right? And maybe you use that for a shiny app, right? You don't do anything with SageMaker or Maybe you don't, you know, need to use S3. You can, you know, call in your in your SageMaker notebook, a, a publicly available data set, and train something on that, right? But I, I really want to emphasize that it is a, a, a fast and, and and you know can be quite intimidating ecosystem. But I actually really do think there's value in just like taking off one piece. And my favorite way to learn is to be driven by something you want to do. Uh, whether that's because it's something your your work needs that you need to do for work or because of a personal interest for a personal project. I'd like to acknowledge before I end the talk, uh, some folks who are really helpful for this presentation, including Jacqueline Nolas for the slide design, uh, my brother Dave Robinson for code advice, uh, my former manager and teammates at Warby Parker, and of course, all of the good dogs, aka every dog. If you'd like to learn more, um, this presentation is shared at bit.ly slash AWS dogs. Uh, you can find my blog at hookedondata.org. I tweet at Robinson underscore yes. Um, as you mentioned at the start, I have a book um, called Build a Career in Data Science at datasidecareer.com. And you can find the podcast, which accompanies the book at podcast.bestbook.cool. And with that, I really thank you for um, you know coming here to listen to the talk, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.